My name is Benton Stokes. I'm a former fundamentalist, post-evangelical worship leader, and songwriter. I enjoy Rye Manhattans, roller coasters, and road trips, just not all at the same time. I'm Elaine O'Rourke, and I'm a teacher, an author, and a spiritual coach. I was a philosophy professor and a liberal pastor in a couple of former lives, and these days, I love aha moments and not-so-dry martinis. We have conversations about life and God with a queer perspective over cocktails, like you. This is Cocktail Theology. So it seems even Italian counts have a bad day. What? Now and then. Okay. So <laughs> so Count Negroni, yes, there was a Count Negroni for okay. whom our cocktail is named. <laughs> he was a count in the early 20th century in Florence. Okay. And he went to his favorite... Like one, two, three, <laughs> that kind of count. Sure. Okay. <laughs> and so <laughs> he went to his favorite bar uh-huh. and his favorite drink was the Americano. Okay. Okay. But he told his bartender that he needed something stronger. The, okay. bar, the Americana was not going to cut it today. Okay. So the bartender, <laughs> the bartender swapped soda water for gin. Oh. Yeah. And traded out the lemon peel uh-huh. for an orange peel. Dang. Right? Right then and there <laughs> was, was born the Negroni. Okay, so, so which makes me ask the question, so what's an Americano? Well, it's a Negroni without gin. Without okay. gin. So, so tell us what's in a Negroni. So a Negroni is a classic th- <laughs> three-ingredient cocktail Who knew? that's been riffed on countless ways. Sure. We riff on it all the time. Countless. Fact, but I'm ch- <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, in fact, this is, this is in fact a riff. Okay. Um, so uh, a true Negroni mm-hmm. is equal parts, three okay. ingredients. The three ingredients are gin. Uh-huh. Sweet vermouth okay. and Campari, Ew. which is a which is a <laughs> right, which is an Italian amaro. Now we don't care for Campari, and honestly, when you go out to a lot of bars in the United States and you order Negroni, you're not going to get Campari. They often swap it out for another amaro, and the one the liqueur that is most commonly swapped out is Aperol. Ah, uh, okay. And that's the way that we've made our Negronis for years. And that's why our Negroni is more on the orange side than the yes. red side. Okay. Yes. And the other thing that's not as radically different, but a little different, is that I didn't do quite equal parts. Okay. I went a touch heavier on the gin and a touch lighter on the Aperol. Good. The Aperol uh, gives it, there's a sweetness to the Aperol, but there's also a bitterness to the mm-hmm. Aperol. It's a very complex flavor, Aperol. It is. And you like it or you don't. And we really like it. (laughs) But in in many cocktails, if you put in the full amount, it's just a little too much. Right. So we just backed it off. Boy, I'm just thinking that that the gin you use and the sweet vermouth you use would make a huge difference in the flavor of this cocktail. It really would. This is really smooth. So this is Tanqueray Gin. This is just their standard Mm -hmm. gin. Yep. And this is Dolan Rouge, which we very often have in our bar. Yep. Uh, and Aperol. I like it. Yeah, I, I do really too. I really like this. It's really, really tasty. And and then again, lots of riffs on this. You can trade out the gin, like you just said. Mm-hmm. Different gin, different vermouth, right. even different Amaro. All those things will change how this drink tastes. For sure. Yeah, I'm thinking that Tanqueray is known as a per- what's called a perfumed gin. Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking about something that's more dry, more juniper forward, mm-hmm. or a different... A different sweet vermouth like a kochi kind of you know right. um would just make a huge difference in this yeah and campari is just a whole other that would make a whole other campari is a whole fascinating. different thing right this is really yummy yeah so this one's an easy one to make at home this is a great cocktail for sitting around the patio in the summer it's really refreshing and tasty mm-hmm. very good thank you for this yeah of course who knew there was a count involved <laughs> no and i've drunk these countless times uh, right and never known well, you know, I could go on like this for a while, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should probably change the topic. <laughs> okay. So today we're going to do the first of at least two parts. What we're posing is this. You might be an evangelical if... Dot, mm. dot, dot. <laughs> and in this episode, we're really just going to get down to sort of where evangelicalism came from and some of the very basic, broad tenets or ideals that they hold as part of their theology. Um, One thing that I do want to say is just because you belong to an evangelical church 
or an evangelical denomination does not automatically make you an evangelical. Right. So we'll start there. Okay. Um, churches have doctrines. Yeah. And I don't think I've ever belonged to a church that I 100% adhered to their doctrine. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And no one should, really. <laughs> I mean, you should come. You should have your own beliefs. Like, right. you should come up with your own theology. Correct. So I know folks who go to a Southern Baptist church who are lovely, lovely people, devoted in their faith, and not the stereotypical Southern Baptist that most of us think of. Okay, so so it sounds like maybe we should start with distinguishing between basic evangel- historical evangelical ideas mm-hmm. and what it means to be an evangelical denomination or an evangelical church. Yeah, I like that. And then we can go on and talk about things like, but what do evangelicals, self-classified evangelicals tend to believe now? Love that. Okay, 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 I got it. So you've described yourself as having grown up in a fundamentalist atmosphere. Would you have considered yourself a fundamentalist, an evangelical, a Christian? Like, what language would you have used if somebody who wasn't of your same stripe had asked you? Well, first of all, I just called myself a Christian. If people wanted to drill down on that, I would say I belong to a holiness church. Mm. Um, And holiness is a subset of uh, evangelical fundamentalist churches whose theology uh, comes from Methodism. I won't bore everybody with the (laughs) tiny bit of history I know. But I would say, you know, I'm a Nazarene, but nobody knows what that means either. Right. So generally, if I had to really classify it, I would say I, I am a type of Methodist. Not that that's actually accurate, but that's the closest thing I could get to that people would actually sure. understand. Sure, I get, as a as a kid, I get I get that's why I no 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 no. I mean I understand why why you were saying that. And I'm sitting here for those of you who can't see me, which is pretty much everybody. I'm smiling because because the way you just described that is I'm sure the way people think about it. Yeah, and yet there's so many distinctions that you just made there that wouldn't necessarily fit. And that's not bad, but it's mm-hmm. just, it tells us something. Right. Sure. Right? Yeah. It's kind of like, where do freckles come from? You could ask almost, you could ask, unless you ask a dermatologist who might also tell you something different, <laughs> right. you're going to get very different things. They're yeah. genetic. They're caused yeah. by the sun. They're, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a similar kind of, and I think that evangelical, and isn't it interesting that evangelical and evangelical have kind of a different feel to them, mm. even though it's officially the same word? Anyway, um, but it's interesting to me because it is... It is so much more complicated than our news media would make it sound. Oh, definitely. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So here's a little trivia. It is generally believed, the general, the general way of thinking about the history of evangelicalism mm-hmm. is that Martin Luther was the first evangelical. Okay. Okay. Partly because of his bibliocentricity, the idea that... Scripture is central Mm -hmm. to Christian faith and practice. Yes. Okay. He was making the distinction about Scripture being central as opposed to tradition being central. Okay. Okay? We could go on to that for like years, but that's the kind of the basic difference he was making. And And in doing so, is he pushing against something here? Sure. So he was pushing against what we talk about as the historical churches. Right. Okay. Okay. Where apostolicism, that is, Mm -hmm. St. Peter touched so-and-so who touched so-and-so who touched so-and-so who then kept, and that's how the priesthood comes about. Yeah. Or the the church leadership comes about. Yeah. So he was pushing against that, but he was also pushing against um, a certain kind of authority and against tradition being held more strongly than what the Bible said. Okay. Now, if you're a Protestant... I think of any stripe, you look at that and say to yourself, well, of course the Bible's more important. Well, not necessarily, Mm -hmm. of course, Mm -hmm. right? So Martin Luther's considered generally the first evangelical. Okay. Okay. And then just historically, um, there are lots of people who come out of that evangelical tradition, Mm -hmm. but some of the more famous ones would be the Wesleys. John Wesley, who was the founder accidentally of Methodism. Right. Um, The Pietists Mm -hmm. came out of that. So all of those guys in the in the Reformation 
that particular branch of the Reformation uh -huh. would be considered the evangelical branch. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. In more recent days, uh -huh. so if you come, if you jump ahead a few hundred years to the United States in specific, uh -huh. okay, the modern version of evangelicalism in the United States was, ready? Uh -huh. A counter movement to fundamentalism. Wow. Okay. 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 So fundamentalism, as you know, had come up in really sort of in response and reaction to a scientific view that was becoming stronger. Ah. Darwin <laughs> had not been rejected by Christians to begin with. Mm -hmm. There was no problem because there wasn't this that w Christianity in general at that point did not think that science uh -huh. and the Bible really had much to do with each other necessarily. Right. But Darwin and that way of thinking about science became threatening, but it also became a thing that could be articulated. Mm -hmm. Point one, point two, point three, point four. Yeah. So the, the people who wrote the fundamentals were essentially trying to point one, point two, point three, point four about all of all of the world mm. contra Darwin. Okay. Okay. So they were trying to lay out what would be the basic tenets of what they believed about the world, as opposed to what science, the big scare quotes, thought about the world. Okay. Okay. Move on from there. Evangelicals pushed against fundamentalists. Huh. Okay. Okay. So one of the things that I find really interesting about the history of evangelicalism is it is a push against mm. movement. Mm -hmm. It was pushing against the historical church. Mm -hmm. It was pushing against hierarchy. It then became a pushing against fundamentalism. Wow. And then in the political range, it became pushing against a particular strand of politics. Okay. And one more thing about this stuff, and then I promise I'll get off it. Oh. The, the National Association of evangelicals mm -hmm. was started in 1942 wow yeah okay uh -huh. so 1942 in the united states beginning of world war ii mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. part of world war ii it was in response to the national council of churches right 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 which was the mainline denominations yeah. coming mm -hmm. together in response to what was going on <laughs> in the world right okay okay so all of this that part of the nature, I would say, of the evangelical stance has been historically a contra something else. Always a response to something else. A response to something else. Mm -hmm. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. But it, it, I think it kind of gives the family character yeah. of what, what that has meant over time. Gotcha. Okay. So setting aside all the political stuff. Yes. What would you say are like... You might be an evangelical if, if we're talking, remember, from, from Martin Luther forward, what sounds, what kind of feels like maybe the basis of what we might call evangelicalism? Some of the theological views that I equate with evangelicalism are things like substitutionary atonement. Okay. Original sin. Okay. Um, this would make such a good quiz to play at parties. <laughs> Right. Trivial Pursuit, the Evangelical Edition. <gasps> oh my gosh, we could be so rich. Okay, we could make sorry, a lot of money sorry. off of that. Yeah. Going back to your pushing against, and we're not going to get into a ton of this in this conversation, but it seems like evangelicals, particularly in the last 50 years, have made a central part of their teaching, lifestyle, etc., pushing against what culture is promoting, or what they perceive culture to be promoting. They are uh, anti-abortion, generally. They are anti-gay, generally. But those don't really apply. I mean, they come from their theological view or maybe their view of what God thinks of us. Mm, um, okay. One of the courses that we teach, 17 Ideas, has to do with things that people think about God, whether they realize they think those <laughs> things about God or not. Right. And so a lot of... The, the things that we talk about in that course are like, don't believe anything bad about God, for instance. Right. 
you know, coming from that position, if you don't believe anything bad about God, then you perceive God to be loving, kind, generous, yeah. magnanimous toward mankind, all those kinds of right. things. But if you if you come at God as a God that gets angry or a God who's vengeful, like what many people call an Old Testament version of God or whatever, <laughs> even though we know that even the God in the Old Testament wasn't that then then really your motivation to follow God is more out of fear. So I believe okay. that a lot of evangelicals follow God out of out of fear. Okay. And and as part of that fear there's a threat of a everlasting hell that happens after you die. Okay. That's part of an an evangelical worldview or an evangelical god view too. Which, and I, I don't think any of that is wrong about modern evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. But there are essentially four, count them four, mm -hmm. basic tenets to evangelicalism. Wow, okay. Okay, ready? Yeah. Ready? Okay. So the first one is Bible centricity. Sure, okay. okay? The Bible is central. And notice that I'm not saying the Bible is inerrant, the Bible is infallible, any of those things. The Bible is simply central. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the first one. Mm-hmm. The second one is what we call, it's got a funny Latin name, but let's just call it, it's cross-centered. Okay. Okay. In other words, something happened on the cross that was really, really, really important. Right. Okay. And it has to do with atonement, but not mm -hmm. necessarily any particular form of atonement. Okay. Okay. In this case, atonement means that um, Jesus did something that we couldn't do for ourselves that had to do with relationship with God. Yes. So some kind of very, and there there's specific kinds of atonement, but that's mm -hmm. but that's one of the ones that has mm -hmm. to do with that. Um, the third basic tenet of evangelicalism is conversion. Right. Okay? Sure. Yes. So you can't be born an evangelical. You have to be born again, an evangelical. Yes. Okay. Now that you could be baptized into an evangelical faith. But it is still incumbent upon you to claim your whatever it is, but to be born again and choose to be converted, whether right. it's at one fell swoop or over time. Right. That's the three of the four. The fourth one is activism. Activism. Now, 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 activism here doesn't mean you get out there with signs in front of your local Planned Parenthood. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Activism means active. Okay. Ism. Active how? <laughs> Act well, thank you for asking. <laughs> it means a couple of things. Okay. One, it means that that behavior matters. If you've actually had your heart converted, you will behave differently. Ah, yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there's something about that in it. There's something about needing to share the good news. Right. Which comes out of evangel, right? Mm -hmm. Good news. Mm -hmm. At its very base, it's that sense that faith is an active thing. It, it, it is lived out rather than it being a little thing that you can say, I have this, I see you hang it on your wall and you're done. Ah, okay. Does this tie closely to then the passage in James about faith without works is dead? Might. If you're thinking historically, it's the difference between being born into a state church. Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. Right. That combination of the necessity of conversion... Mm -hmm. And the necessity of activity of some kind, right. that varies dramatically. Mm -hmm. Those are two of the big parts of evangelicalism in its roots. Right. So you're going to choose Jesus and then you're going to act differently. You're going to be converted and you're going to whatever, act differently. Yeah, whatever that... But those are different. Those are different. Right. But but in, in, in the church mm -hmm. I grew up in, that would That's have been right. you give your heart to Jesus. That's right. Yeah. So deeply, that sense of conversionism means that your heart is converted, not your mind. Your heart is converted. Right. And if your heart is actually converted, you will change your behavior. If you're, if, and this is not an evangelical stance, but the logical outcome is, that, is this. If your mind is just converted, you may not change your behavior. Mm -hmm. It has to be a conversion of the heart. But interestingly, one can <laughs> have their heart quote unquote converted and yet nothing actually changes unless their mind is also Well, there's some argument about that. Oh. 
right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I am acquainted with all of this, but it's just been a long time since I've thought about it, yeah. and I've never talked about it like this. Right. I mean, it, the language is always give your heart to Jesus. That's right. But the truth is, we know that if we don't start thinking about things differently, Correct. our behaviors actually won't change. Correct. Correct. And we can give our minds to Jesus, if you will. We can say, I believe X, Y, Z. And have zero change. And And have have no conversion of our heart at all. Of course. So that conversion of the heart stuff comes from John Wesley, right? Yeah. John Wesley underwent what we call a conversion experience. And the way he described it, and I do love this, is that his heart was strangely warmed. Mm. I love that image. To me, that is the best possible sense of evangelical style conversion. Yeah. Something in your heart changes. You know, I, I rant about people who claim their amazing grace moment without actually ever having any. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing grace moment. Yes. Where your heart suddenly or or over time shifts and you see the world differently. Differently, yes. Okay. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I have no issue with that at okay. all. So when I was pastoring the very liberal, and I'm using that word specifically, the very liberal church, I deliberately dived into evangelicalism. Because we were missing all of that. It was a very intellectual exercise. Mm -hmm. Very attuned to the ways of thinking from experience of the world. Mm -hmm. Attached to ideas that included the best possible kind of critique, criticism of the Bible. In the way you would criticize any other written text. Oh, sure. Okay. So not, not negative, but... Pay attention. Actually yeah. take it apart. Look at, yeah. look at what you're looking at. Yeah. But Jesus was scary. Mm. Not not Jesus the, the activist. Not Jesus mm-hmm. the loving guy. Mm-hmm. But Jesus was right. scary. Right. The Bible was, eh, you know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's... You know what I mean? Yeah. So it had all of this, this very loving, very loving, but intellectual way of thinking about things. Yes. So I dived into evangelicalism because I was like, okay, first of all, we have no heart in the Jesus aspect of this. Mm -hmm. We have no heart in the Bible of this. One of the things that used to make me crazy was that within that denomination, you could transfer from one church to another, which makes sense, except it also was supposed to be a church that was local. Oh, okay. Which means that whatever that church over there thought was okay for them Mm -hmm. would then be okay for you. Oh, okay. Hmm. Which is how denominations work. It's a very normal way of thinking. But I felt like as the pastor, I needed to kind of play with all of this and say, okay, so what does all that mean? What, What kind of people are we becoming when we think this kind of thing? Yeah. Do we want to talk differently about it? Do we want to think differently? Anyway, so I sort of dived into evangelicalism Mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. And... For a while, I claimed evangelicalism. Hmm. So I was a very broad scare quote evangelical uh-huh. Uh-huh. liberal pastor. Uh huh. Uh huh. Because I was really trying to put the Bible central. Yeah. Trying to understand that whatever happened on the cross mattered. Yes. Understood that whatever was going on in my heart, my mind, better be lived out or it was useless. Yes. Okay? Right. Right. And that I was trying over time to. Um, work out my salvation. Mm, In other words, convert my heart over time by focusing on Jesus, by focusing on Mm -hmm. you. You know what I mean? I like that. That's the idea. Yeah. That's not what most of us mean by evangelical. It's not. (laughs) Or conversion. Or conversion. Right. And that's, and and I can tell you, it did not earn me friends (laughs) in my (laughs) denomination. (laughs) No, it probably didn't. Doing this, right? Yeah. So that's kind of the the basics of evangelicalism. Awesome. This is a great conversation to continue. Listeners, we love hearing from you, especially if you are an evangelical or if you are a post-evangelical, which is kind of how I categorize myself, I think. Someone who's kind of moved on from identifying as an evangelical, even though I know that there are there are things about my own theology that come from my evangelical roots. And I don't want to separate from that. Right. Uh, I think I would lose something important and special if I if I did, if I even yes. tried. Yes. Which is why deconstruction can be dangerous sometimes. We would love to hear from you. Mm. Cocktailtheology.com is where we are. Send us a note 
And uh, we will pick this up again another time. Yay. Yay. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Funny how the view can change, how life just seems to rearrange itself. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a like and hit subscribe wherever you're listening right now. We welcome your comments, questions, and ideas for conversations and for cocktails. Please get in touch with us at our website, cocktailtheology.com. Cocktail Theology is a production of SFS. Our theme song is Moving On Feels Pretty Good, recorded by yours truly, Benton Stokes. You can find my music wherever you stream your favorite artists. Join us next Thursday for another new episode.